Welcome to A Walk in the Garden. I'm Liz Davey, and this episode is being filmed in my garden in Norfolk. It's the very end of February, almost leap year, and we're going into March. It's been an unusual year. Looking back over last year in my record book, at this time last year we had snow up to about over my knees, at least. It was starting to melt, but it had a long ways to go. This year the ground isn't even hardly frozen. We've had a couple storms, but they've all turned out to be rain. We may get a little bit more snow before the season's over, but our chance of a major snowstorm or a season like last year, I think is pretty much over. Poking around in the garden and starting to clean up a little bit, I'm noticing that things are starting to come up. The tarragon and the oregano are starting to put up little green shoots. I trimmed that back in the fall. Uh, there will be other things to be cut back a little later. I'll wait until this uh, lavender cotton or Santillana actually starts putting on buds before I trim it back almost to the base. Another one has stayed green pretty much all winter. This is a green version. That's the gray version. Thyme also has uh, looking pretty good and putting out some new green shoots as is the chives are starting to show some green down at the base. Certainly not anything ready to pick, but in another month we may see some action there if it continues to be warm on some of the days. The temperature's been fluctuating pr pretty wildly. My garden shed, which gets some sun during the day and is sheltered, has had temperatures that go from 28 degrees on up to almost 100 depending on whether the sun's shining and we're having one of those warm days. We also have sorrel, which is one of our earliest vegetable crops, and that's starting to show shoots. That'll be actually one of the first things in the garden that we can pick. Rhubarb is also early, but that hasn't even broken the ground yet. A little more time in this area and in front, and tansy, which is also starting to show some green sprouts. I'm not going to do any cleaning up because we still may get some more snow and other bad weather, so I'll leave things alone for a while. Some of the things I could start cutting back, and uh, we'll do that over in the perennial garden. Working in the perennial garden, walking into the perennial garden, we left a few things up for some winter interest, but those can now you can, uh, on a nice day, especially some of the days we've had that are up in the 60s when you want to be outside, you can start trimming the, some of these things back. And this would be a sedum, a tall sedum. And I'll trim that back all the way to the ground and use my garden clippers for that one. Once you get down uh, into the plant a little bit, you'll see that there are some nice green shoots coming up. This garden was cleaned off quite a bit last fall. Some years I get most of the uh, perennials cut back in the fall. Other years, if winter comes a little early, I don't get that much done and have to do it all in the spring. This year I got everything cut back that I wanted to, just left a few things for, for winter. But now these have kind of passed their prime. They aren't even that interesting and it's time to go. But those can be cut back at any time. This area has quite a few spring bulbs in it and it's nice to kind of clean it up before the spring bulbs start doing their show. Uh, speaking of spring bulbs, here I go again with the deer spray. This seems to be a repeating thing on this show, and indeed it's a repeating thing in my life with deer in this area. 
when we've had snow, the whole area is peppered with deer tracks, and so we know they're here, and they will eat things if given a chance. I have some tulips that have started to come up. They're an early tulip, and I'm gonna spray those. Crocuses and tulips get sprayed. Uh, deer do not particularly like daffodils, and so I won't spray those because they don't bother them. But the tulips, they do bother, and if you have the tulips come up and form nice buds, the deer will one day evening come by and eat them all, taking just the nice bud, and you will have no blooms at all, unless you use something to protect them, either a cage or spray. And my preferred is spray. And as long as you get out frequently and check and see what's coming up, and even when the, the sprigs are just two inches high, they will find them and have them for lunch. So we want to keep those sprayed. The daffodils, again, I have a number of those. Those, they don't seem to bother. They don't like them, uh, so they should be fine. Crocuses are another thing that they do prefer. Some of the early crocus tomasianus, I have quite a few of those in back. They don't seem to bother those as much. They also tend to be squirrel proof, but they are not chipmunk proof. So I always give them a little spritz of spray. But here are a few crocuses coming up in amongst things. So I'll just give it a little spritz of the spray. The grape hyacinths, they've eaten a lot of the foliage. The foliage for the grape hyacinths comes up in the winter and stays all winter. This foliage is in pretty good shape. They will put on more foliage in the spring after they bloom. But the deer do nibble down the foliage in the winter. It doesn't seem to affect the blooms, however. I will give it a spray if I'm out here and work by. You can also trim back some of the other things. Uh, when it comes to grasses rather than clippers, I prefer to use scissors. It seems to work a lot better than trying to use the clippers. And again, the grasses at this point need to be just cut down. This is one called Cheyenne Sky, not too tall. Gets a little reddish in the fall, which is why I like it here. And it looked nice earlier, but now the snow has kind of matted it down and it's ready to get a little haircut. And again, the scissors, pair of kitchen scissors, do a pretty good job on it fairly quickly. You can cut through good stems. And that's ready to rake out later on and we'll add that to the compost. So that one's done. And there are may well be some other things. I have primroses in this area and they too will start blooming fairly soon. The deer don't seem to bother those either. And this one, after it blooms, will get divided. There are probably one, two, five or six plants in this clump. So we can divide those and spread them around the garden a little later in the season. In the vegetable garden, I now have a large pile of brush. And behind the vegetable garden is an even taller pile of brush. After the last windstorm, we had a lot of trees damaged and limbs that fell. And those will be burned. Norfolk does require that you go down to the police and fire station and pick up a burning permit. Um, it's free, but you do have to make an appearance and uh, sign up for it and get it. <clears throat> when you wish to burn, uh, burning is from the end of January through the end of April, mid-January to the end of April. If, by May 1st, your burning needs to be done. And it's from 10 to 4 uh, during the day. And you have to call each day after 10 to get permission to burn that day. If the wind is too brisk, they will not allow you to burn. 
and they do keep track of who is burning on those days. There are definitely some rules involved in open burning and you need to follow the rules and get the permit. There's quite a nice little fine if you don't and burn anyway. I still have the garlic covered with straw and I have parsley over here and you may be able to see that the parsley is still green. I could come out and pick a little parsley and use it. In fact, I still have some in the refrigerator that I picked not that long ago. With the mild season that we've had and the straw covering has been just enough to keep it green. This parsley will, when the weather gets a little warmer, suddenly really green up and we'll have a very nice spring crop of parsley. The garlic, I planted some garlic early. That came up in the fall and will continue to grow in the spring. I planted another uh, bunch of it a little later and it's just starting to show through the straw. It too should catch up once the uh, season changes. Over on the other side of the garden are the strawberries still under their winter blanket of straw. Again, in about another month or a month and a half, we'll pull that straw back and the strawberries will start to grow. Over on the other side, I covered some kale and some onions. And that's a rather an experiment. This was young kale and I don't know if it will come back or not. So we're keeping it covered with straw to protect it for now. But again, when the weather starts to get a bit warmer, Kale is a cool season crop, so it, if it's going to grow, it will grow probably in another month. The same with some onions, and these are supposed to be perennial onions, and again, they're so, showing some signs of green right now, just waiting for a little more nice weather. Back here I have my winter seeding pots. If you were with me uh, for last month's show, we planted a number of perennial and early annual flower seeds in plastic milk jugs and put them out in under the snow. They were covered with snow for the week before last and now they're just waiting and waiting for warmer weather. These are often seeds that need a little time with some cool weather before they sprout. Some perennials are that way. They need to have what is called a vernalization period, which means they need some cold weather before they will sprout with the warm weather. That's what some of these are getting. And also there are some onion seeds and some of the uh, flowers that need a bit of chilling. And I have also some Brussels sprouts and some broccoli, which hopefully will come up early and then can be transplanted into the garden the end of February, early March. Again, if the weather continues to be reasonably mild. Now let's check out the backyard in the shade garden. I've worked cleaning up a lot of the brush back in this shade garden. Uh, we had a lot of tree limbs that came down in the storm. Do have a few things that are coming out though. The, the hellebores really don't mind bad weather and they're blooming, uh, coming up and blooming more and more all the time. Uh, I will cut off the old leaves of these plants and they'll form new leaves after they've bloomed. We also have snowdrops that are in bloom and uh, I started out with just a few here and they've spread around a little bit and will probably continue to spread. I do let them go to seed so that they will kind of spread and fill out the area. This is another hellebore that has a greener type blossom and uh, it again has buds on it. There are a lot of crocuses in this area and I don't know that you can see it. Here's a small one here. Today is a cloudy day. On a sunny day, they open right up. These are the little early crocuses. The, there are two types of crocus. One that is a smaller variety and is earlier. And 
this is a, a variety called uh, Tomasianus, which again is a purple, and it spreads. And I have it spreading all through this area in the ground cover. And it, uh, on a sunny day, in another week or so, we will just have a field of blue in among the green and the hellebores in bloom in pink. It's one of the more colorful times in this garden. So I like to get it kind of cleaned out before things start blooming in the area. The daffodils that are in here and some of the other spring bulbs haven't even come up yet because this is a little colder area. The ice is pretty much out of the pond. The fish are there. They're swimming very, very slowly. And certainly I would not want to start feeding them anywhere near this time. They need to wait until the temperature of the water is about 50 degrees. And we're still getting ice on the pond in the morning, which tells me it's closer to 35 or 40 degrees. So we have to wait a while before we can start feeding the fish. This year I need to buy some new pond equipment. So now is the time to start thinking about that and deciding and ordering any equipment that I might need. Another thing I can do now is some pruning. Much of my pruning this year is probably going to be to repair damage that's been done to the trees. Uh, there are a lot of things that are hanging here and there and things that have broken off or are in the process of breaking off. And those are the first things that I'll prune out. After that, I'll prune to shape what's left of any trees or bushes that were damaged. The other thing I can do is come over to the other side and I'm going to walk right through the garden over to this area. And I can pick some forsythia. And this is the forsythia. And I've already picked some. But we'll take that inside and we can force it into bloom so that we'll have some blooms inside. And the traditional way of doing it is to soak it in warm water for three or four hours and then to hammer on the stalk a bit so that it will uptake water and put it into warm water. Uh, I brought in some pussy willows and also some of the forsythia and some cherry. Uh, I have a small cherry tree back here that was damaged in the storm. So I took some of the branches that were damaged and uh, cut off some sprigs and brought them inside so that uh, I can perhaps get a few extra cherry blooms out of it. But we lost the top of the cherry tree. so. It may be a, a goner all the way around. We'll see. All right. I'm going to move over to the bird feeding area. When I was out shopping for bird seed and other uh, things, dog food and bird seed, or the things I buy at the uh, farm store, I bought a cake of suet that was had a bird bluebird picture on the front of it, and it was uh, supposed to be very good for bluebirds. I put it in the feeder, and the next day I had three bluebirds feeding at the feeder, so I guess they do like it. Uh, bluebirds are back. If you have bluebird houses, make sure that you've cleaned them out from old nesting material if you hope to have the bluebirds nesting in them. Bluebirds are one of the birds that come back quite early, and uh, some of them I think even stay all season now or fairly nearby, but I did have three bluebirds last weekend at the feeder, so they are back and they will be thinking about nesting soon. On any of these warm days we've had, we've also had robins that have been in the area. Some robins do stay all season, but uh, this is a little early for them to be making a lot of noise and chasing each other around. But uh, this is on the warm days. Today it's a little cooler, they're more interested in getting some bird seed and getting some shelter from the snow and rain that's supposed to move in a little later today. Now let's go inside and plant a few seeds and do a little cooking. Okay, the, I brought up the piece of forsythia in that we just cut and I'm going to add it to my vase a large vase of water, warm water, and you can see that the pussy willows that I put in here just last weekend, about four days ago, have already started blooming. Pussy willows are very quick. 
a lot of these have good buds, and the buds on the cherry are starting to show a little pink. So I think they too are going to bloom shortly. The forsythia also is at a stage where I don't think I need to pound the base of it or soak them in hot water. The buds are far enough along, they're almost ready to go. And inside a warm room, in some warm or room temperature water, they're going to bloom fairly fast. It's kind of nice to have a little dose of spring, especially if we do get a little more snow. Another thing that I like is to buy a primrose. And this, the grocery stores have them, the nurseries have them. And this one's a little red primrose. And these are hardy. You can keep them in the house now in the spring. And this one actually has a couple plants, I think, in it. Maybe it's just one. But it has a number of buds. And you just take off the spent flowers when they start to turn brown. Keep it watered. Uh, it will let you know when it needs water. It will get kind of droopy. But uh, try to get it before then. And keep it watered. And let the water drain out after you've watered it. And then when the weather changes, say maybe the end of April, having been in a warm house, this plant can then, when the temperature is a little higher, move out. You saw the primrose in the garden, that, and that was one that I planted from one I bought a couple years ago. And it's now five plants. I can divide that and move it around the garden. So this was another one that I will plant out. If I buy one or two every year, and add them, I'll soon have quite a nice little number to bloom every spring. And they'll bloom in probably early May along with some of the other spring bulbs. But for now, it's a nice accent in the house. Another house plant is amaryllis. And these are the amaryllis that I had in years past. And you can see I have one that's almost flowering, and these are two buds on the amaryllis. This amaryllis was removed from the pot and planted last year in the garden. And we put it in a sunny spot, and I kept a, a little fertilizer on it and kept it watered. And then in the fall, I took it into the garden shed and let it completely dry out and let the leaves all die back. Before it got really cold, I brought it in the house and just kind of tucked it back in my other house plants and let it sit. I started watering it in about November, and a few weeks ago, I looked, and here we have three lovely buds. I kept it in a cooler spot in my house, and we will have three blooms. Again, now that it's up and growing, I will keep it well watered and fertilize it along with other house plants when I fertilize them. Once the blooms have stopped blooming, once they have uh, started drooping and turning brown, I'll cut the bloom stalk back at the base, and we'll start all over again by putting it into the garden and having the bulb. It's a large bulb that's planted in the pot, and we start the process over again. Sometimes they'll even split and make two amaryllis from one bulb. But uh, you can keep them going for several years by planting them outside in the summer. Today I'm going to plant some more seeds. It's, a, it's way too early to do things like tomatoes and peppers. They would be way too far along if you put them under lights now to put outside because we can't put anything outside until probably about the end of May. So we'll, And they take maybe six to eight weeks to be of size to transplant into the garden. So end of February is way too early to start those things. All you'll end up with are plants that are too large and leggy, and they'll have a transplant setback, which means they will not grow well once you transplant them. It will take a long time for them to establish. So you don't want to plant things too early. There are a lot of different charts online about when to plant different things. I kind of go by the packages and what they say about how many weeks it takes for them to germinate. And some things take longer than others. I like to use these cell packs. Uh, these are an old variety from Gardener's Supply. And they have a new, new system now that's similar, but uh, not quite the same. What it is is there's water in the reservoir below. And I've soaked the wicking fabric that comes with it in the water. And I'll put it on top of this base. And then on top of that, 
we put the cell pack. And I've already prepared a couple of them. I'm going to put on some gloves to try to keep my hands a little cleaner. I'm going to be using germinating soil, which is a fine soil with usually a lot of uh, sphagnum or peat moss in it to make it very light in texture. And I've dampened the soil as, as it comes out of the bag. It needs to be dampened. And I'm going to fill these little cells right up with it and press it down. This is a process I'll be repeating for tomatoes, peppers, Bro some more broccoli, and uh, some of the other plants. But I want to start inside. Today I'm starting some flowers. These sometimes take a little longer. Again, regular impatience. I won't start for another two or three weeks, probably even a month. Now, any watering of these cell packs is not then done from the bottom. Each one has a little area that is indented uh, in this, this area, in one edge of the planter, and you can pour water into that. And you want the water level to come up right to the top. I don't fill them completely full until they get, get them under my plant lights, otherwise I end up spilling it all over the floor. And they're heavier that way too. But I'm pressing down the soil, and then I'm ready to plant some seeds. And I cannot plant with gloves on. I need to feel the seeds in my hand in order to do it. I'm going to try this year some New Guinea impatiens. New Guinea impatiens are quite expensive to buy. They're immune to the uh, virus that has been destroying a lot of the regular impatience that people buy. And I thought it would be nice if I could grow about a dozen of them to set in pots. I don't know, having never done it, if it will work. But the, I'm going to try to put one or two of these small seeds in each cell. And you just barely cover them according to the package directions. So just press it in so it, it makes good contact with the soil. They also suggest bottom heat. And I may remove this from the top of, or the bottom of the cell pot cell for a while and put it on a piece of foil on a uh, heat mat in order to get the seeds to germinate. They take a long time. They suggest that at 75 to 80 degrees germinate in 10 to 20 days. Well, that's quite a variation. So we'll give them some time and see what they do. And there are not many seeds in the pack. I think there's probably about 20 seeds in that pack total. But we'll see how that one goes. And at this point, you top it with a dome, and this keeps the humidity in and keeps contact with the seeds. I'm going to do some more seeds over here. Uh, one of my favorite plants is Broalia, which is uh, not very well known, but it has pretty, pretty little blue flowers. It likes the semi-shade, which is another good thing. And it blooms late in the season. So we want to give it a start so we'll have some plants of growing size. It takes a while to germinate, too. And the seeds are tiny. And again, not too many in a package. There we have them. But I think we'll have enough to get 24 because almost every seed is going to germinate.
They're about the size of a grain of pepper. It's really quite a miracle to uh, realize that these will turn into a full-size 8 to 12 inch plant from just the tiny seed. You can get a couple in each of the seed pegs. It looks like so little until you start dividing them up. Bring one in each of these. And then I'll just very lightly pat them down. Again, I'm not covering these at all because they're such tiny seeds. The general rule with seeds is to cover them with about three times their size, which would be almost nothing in this case. And again, I'll have a dome for that size pot. And the next thing I have are some straw flowers. We grew straw flowers successfully last year, and I did have some seeds left. So I'd like to plant some more of those. And these are fireball. These are red ones. And again, a couple of seeds in each. And I might be a little more generous with these because the seeds are a year old. And they may not all germinate. And these are a little larger, so I'll just push a little bit of soil over each of the seeds as I go. I planted these in the garden several years ago, and it took too long for them to develop. By the time they were starting to bloom, we were getting frost, and that killed them. So I knew that I would have to, if I wanted to have some of them, start them early and set them out as plants rather than seeding in the garden. Some seeds you can plant right in the garden. Others that take a long season are better to start. Ahead of time, under lights. These will go under the grow lights. I'll have to keep track of which is which. And the one thing I do to do that is to label them. And I use masking tape because I can change it from year to year. And, and a Sharpie. And I'll just make three labels. And, and I put the, the kind of and the date. And that would be I'll also write this down in the garden record that I keep. And this is how I, from year to year, know when to plant things. If it doesn't work out and they needed to be planted earlier, I can mark that in my book and look back and next year I'll know that I should have planted them a little earlier. And I like to put the label on the actual cell pack instead of on the base because sometimes I turn them around or switch them around. And if it's on the wrong spot, then you don't know what it is especially when it comes time to transplant these seedlings into little larger pots. It's helpful to have it there. I'm going to shake some of my dirt off there. And we're going to do another little project. I saw a wreath in, this, in a picture that I really liked. And I thought it would be nice to have a new spring wreath. 
and one that could be put up for St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day and Easter are kind of close this year. Easter is very early. It's the end of March, actually. And so I wanted something that I could put up and would stay for the month and be suitable for both holidays and for just spring in general. So I bought a twig wreath at the craft store. All of these items are available at the craft store. And I used a wire to make a little hanger. And then I used a piece of dry foam. This comes in a package of three. And dry, there are two types of floral foam. One is dry and one is wet. This is the dry foam because I'm going to be using silk or artificial flowers for this wreath so that it'll last. And if you are using real flowers in a floral arrangement, then you want to use the wet foam because that will keep your flower stems from wilting. I've attached with wire one piece of the, of the dry foam to the base of the wreath. And I bought three different types of flowers and foliage. I bought a whole fern bunch, and they come in a, a bunch, and it's all plastic on the bottom. And what I did is I cut the pieces away from the actual base. And I did that with all the flowers. I used wire cutters, and just uh, in my needle nose pliers, there's a wire cutter in the back of it. And I cut them off. And these are a little, uh, just a little filler type flower. And then I also bought a bunch of tulips. So I had three bunches of flowers. And I only needed a few of each one. And so what I'm going to do is start by putting in the tulips. And I, I had a picture to work from. And I found it online and I printed it off. So it uh, is one that I think I can at least approximate. And I may alter it slightly another time. But we wanted some ferns to kind of cover the, the base. And I could also use a little moss in here. And I'm going to need some more ferns, I think. Get around back. Again, you need to play around with it a little bit. And I have a few more pieces over here, which we can take some fern out to use. I think I've got a couple sprigs left. These need to be cut. And again, just uh, there is a wire inside each of these, so you can cut it. We want to put some of the, the ferns down this way. a couple more pieces. Add some more sprigs of white to kind of fill it in. And this also has some leaves with it. going to finish it off with a bow. And I've made the bow using two types of ribbon. And uh, I was wondering how I was going to get the ribbon to stay as, as I made the bow, how I'd get them to stay together without having it all slip around. And I discovered that uh, 
double-sided scotch tape worked really well to just put on the piece of ribbon in the center and then I could stick my other ribbon to it. I left the tails loose on this one. At that point, I fastened it with a wire. I made the bow and then used a floral pick. These are handy things to have. They're not very expensive. And you can fasten various things to the picks and then poke it into the arrangement. So we're going to finish off the wreath with the bow. And if I need to take out some of the tape that's holding it down to kind of let it loosen, I can now do that. And so there I have a, a floral wreath to put up that will last through St. Patrick's Day. It's nice and green. And uh, we might want to add a little more of the, uh, if I see any of the base showing, I can always add more of the greenery underneath to cover it or a little sphagnum moss. We'll do a nice job with that. So there we have a, a wreath for the, the holiday season. And you can bend these around a little bit to make them look a little more natural. It will last. I can put this outdoors, actually, on the front of the house. And uh, it'll be fairly good for when the weather is pretty stable. And this can curl around a little bit. So we've recreated the picture, I think, pretty accurately. Might have to reduce or push the tulips in just a little bit more, but that's definitely a possibility. And having bought the three different floral pieces, I had enough left from the three bunches to put them after they'd been cut off into a vase and make a nice arrangement for the table. So I can hang my wreath and then have a corresponding arrangement to put on the table. And these are just put into a, a pitcher. There's no foam, no water, just arranged inside the pitcher. But it makes a nice spring looking, spring green bouquet. Okay, now it's time to go in the kitchen and cook a few things. Today we're going to do a little celebrating of March. March, one of the holidays is St. Patrick's Day, and this year Easter is later in the month, so we'll be doing that for our next show. But in addition to St. Patrick's Day, there is a phenomenon called March Madness if you happen to be a college basketball fan, and we are. So fortunately, our team's color is green and white. So it fits right in with St. Patrick's Day and March Madness. So we're gonna do a little St. Patrick's Day, some snacks for watching the football game, or just having some friends over on St. Patrick's Day for uh, a few beers and a few snacks. And we're gonna use a St. Patrick's Day theme. And the first thing I'm going to make is called a Reuben dip. A Reuben sandwich is generally rye bread, corned beef, sauerkraut, and a Thousand Island dressing. And this is a hot dip that's put in the oven. And we're going to put it together by using some cream cheese. And I'm using uh, the lighter version, which I generally do use. It's a little less rich. We've got plenty of rich items in this. And I'm going to Get it all off of the wrapper. And this has been softened. And we'll put that in the food processor. Along with a quarter of a cup of mayonnaise. A quarter of a cup of sour cream.
two tablespoons of ketchup and one tablespoon of spicy mustard. It called for horseradish mustard. I didn't have it. I'm using a just a spicy brown mustard instead. And I also want two tablespoons of dill pickle relish. I think maybe we should add that last. Yeah, well, no, we do add it at this point, I guess, to make the dressing. This makes a, the equivalent of kind of a Thousand Island dressing. We're going to buzz that in the food processor until it's combined. It looks pretty good. Now to this we're going to add a quarter of a pound of chopped corned beef, three quarters of a cup of sauerkraut which has been uh, drained and rinsed and drained again. Have to have that for a Reuben. Two cups of Swiss cheese. The recipe suggested a cup and a half of Swiss and a half of Gruyere. Again, I had Swiss, so that's what we have. And one quarter cup of parsley, which has been chopped. This gives it a little, little green color. And I'm going to mix this all together, put it into my casserole dish. And this is going to go into a 350 degree oven for about 20 minutes or so, uh, 15 to 20 minutes. We want it to get nice and bubbly and have that cheese all melt. The next thing I want to do are some uh, Irish potatoes. And I've boiled the potatoes. And what I've done is move my knife and bowl over this way. I've cut each potato in half, cut a little uh, piece off the base of it so it'll stand up nicely just to make it a little flat. Those pieces we don't need. And then I use a melon baller. And this is for cutting balls from uh, melon. And I'm using that to scoop out the center of the potato and just make a nice little cup. Now, theoretically, this would be done while those potatoes are still warm and you could put in your tablespoon of butter and it would melt. However, I did these ahead of time so my potatoes are cold. So I'm going to stick this in the microwave for a minute so that the butter will melt and we can mix up the potatoes. So into the microwave it's going. And bring them over. And I'm going to mash these up a bit. The butter melted into the warm potatoes. Again, if you do these while they are still a little warm from being boiled, they'll mix a little better. And I'm adding a quarter cup of cheddar cheese and about a half cup of chopped corned beef. And a little salt, and we might want to salt the potatoes a little bit too. Just a, a little bit. And possibly some a couple grinds of pepper. 
I used a horseradish cheddar cheese in these, so they'll have a little bit of uh, bite. I'm going to mix that all in. And add a dollop of sour cream just to help it mix a little bit better. And I'll use two spoons to fill these little potato skins with the mixture. Taking the little slice off the bottom really helps. And these two are going to go into the oven. Uh, they suggest 400 for 10 minutes. We have the oven set at 350, so we're going to use that temperature. And they might take a little bit longer. Again, we just want them to get warm, nice and warm. I have one more item, and that's another little snack type food, and it's uh, a kind of sweet and sweet and savory all at once. And we're going to use pretzels and M&Ms and Hershey's Kisses to make it. And I'm going to start out by lining up pretzels on the pan in a shamrock shape. You can get about eight on each sheet comfortably. At this point, I'm going to put a, an unwrapped Hershey's Kiss in the center of each one. And stick them in the oven for two minutes at 200 degrees. That's a, not a very hot oven, but it will work well to melt the chocolate. And we're going to set the timer for that one. Time to get them out of the oven. Carefully. The chocolate is starting to melt. And now we can put a stem on our shamrock with a long pretzel. I'm just kind of moving it down. The melted chocolate's what's going to hold everything together. And if necessary, you can kind of push them back in so that they're touching. And to finish it off, around this time of year, M&M's comes out with their mint M&M's, which are green. And we're going to put one in the center of each of our little treats. And again, it will be held by the chocolate kiss. And we have some shamrock snacks. And I have some that I made earlier. These, uh, it's good if you can put these into the refrigerator and let them harden up, and they will harden up. And I have some on a plate, and then you can see how they, they form together. And I've also put a few in, in little bags. You can hand those out on St. Patrick's Day if you wish. Uh, you can wish your team good luck. <laughs> Makes just a nice little snack, little chocolate and a little pretzel. And 
around. Now let's see how our dip is doing. Needs a little more time. So okay, now it's time to take our dip and potatoes out of the oven. It's nice and bubbly. Put that on a... I'm going to chop a little parsley to put over the top. Sprinkle a little on the top for a little extra green color. And the potatoes are coming out next. And let's see if we can arrange these a little bit this way and on these I'm going to use a little more a little dollop of sour cream and a few of the chives that I put in the freezer last year. We'll just do a few with the sour cream and chives and then people could add their own. You could also use parsley if you didn't have any of the chives or, or green onions would also be very good on them. And there we have our St. Patrick's Day, except for one thing. Got to have something to go with it. So we need to have a nice dark beer. This one's a porter. And our rye bread to go with the dip. I put that into a, a basket. And a few St. Patrick's Day napkins to round it all off. And there's a few snacks for St. Patrick's Day and uh, watching some good basketball. I'm Liz Davey. This has been A Walk in the Garden on NCTV Norfolk Community Cable Television. Thank you for joining me.